Hello, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Planetarium, um, the sky tonight, a part of our MOS at home programming. Uh, my name is Janine, my pronouns are she and her, and I'll be your moderator today. That means that I'll be reading some of your questions and responses, which you can actually submit below using the Q&A button in the bottom of your screen here in the Zoom meeting. If you'd like to see captions during today's program, you can click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. And if you're joining us on Facebook, hello, welcome. Unfortunately, I can't see anything that you're writing today, but thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're so delighted to have all of you here today as our audience. So then let's go ahead and meet our guide who's going to tell us what's up in the sky tonight. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us for the sky tonight. My name is Katie, my pronouns are she and her. And today I will be your guide uh, as we talk about all of the different things that we can see in the sky. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now so that we're looking at a program called Stellarium. It is a free program, open source. You can download it at stellarium.org. If you're interested in playing around with it yourself, we will have that URL at the end of the program presentation today uh, in case you'd like to see it again. Uh, all right, so I have this set for about 11 o'clock tonight, um, or just, just before 11 o'clock, and we're viewing from Cambridge, but this sky will be pretty similar for any kind of mid-northern latitude, um, so you'll see a lot of the same constellations, even if you're not exactly around the same latitude as I am, but I wanted to start off today by um, asking you all, if you look up at the sky at night, what types of objects might you see? So you can type in your answers in the chat. Um, we have one answer from Faith is saying stars. Um, Mariah and Charlotte say constellations. Uh, we've also got planets, more answers for stars. Someone says Orion. Yeah, absolutely. Lots and lots of stars, of course, um, and stars make up the constellations. So we're going to talk about a lot of those today. Planets, um, for the person that mentioned planets, there are a lot of them in the sky right now. It's a really great time for viewing planets. And there was one other thing that I wanted to mention before we really start diving into the constellations today, because right now is a really good time to view shooting stars um, or meteors as we like to call them. So the Perseids right over here, so it's denoted by this uh, green point right here. So that's not one object, but it's actually a group of objects. And meteor showers happen throughout the year at all different times. But right now, the Perseus meteor shower is visible, and it's actually the most active meteor shower. So you're more likely to see uh, meteors right now than you would at any other time of the year. So this meteor shower did peak already a few days ago, um, but it's still very visible and it will be visible for another week or so. And the rate of meteors is on average about 40 to 50 per hour. So when we think about meteor showers, we tend to think of lots and lots of streaks of light all over the sky. It's not quite like that, uh, but you might be able to see quite a few if you go out to a dark area and you look up at the sky, let your eyes get adjusted uh, to the dark and you'll hopefully be able to see some really awesome meteors. Now it's called the Perseids because it's named after the constellation that it originates from. So it's not actually coming from the stars that are in the constellation, but it's just coming from that region of the sky. So a lot of different meteor showers are named after various constellations because that's where all of the uh, dust and debris is actually coming from because meteors are very small. They're like smaller than a grain of sand a lot of the time and it's really just debris that's been left over by comets and the earth is kind of moving through this big cloud of debris in space and so that's why we tend to have these meteor showers around the same time every year is because the earth is moving through that same cloud every year so lots of pieces of debris coming through our atmosphere heating up uh, because of friction with all the gases in the atmosphere and that's why we see a little streak of light and it kind of looks like a star that's shooting 
shooting across the sky, so that's why we call them shooting stars, uh, but they're actually quite tiny. So if you're interested in seeing any meteors, I suggest looking for the Perseids over the next uh, few days, and they You'll probably have the best luck if you're looking really, really late at night, uh, but before the sun rises. So all the times that we're generally sleeping, but if you wanted to stay up late one night, you might be able to uh, spot some of those awesome meteors. All right, so um, today I wanted to talk about a lot of the bright, prominent constellations, as well as some of my favorites. So I like to always start in the north. Um, right now we're looking north, northwest, and just take a look at this part of the sky, make some observations, let me know if you see anything that you recognize. Feel free to type all, all of that in the chat anything you recognize, or if you don't recognize anything, that's okay too. You could put a question mark. Yeah, I know sometimes when I'm in a really dark sky area, it's hard to see things that I'm familiar with because there's so many stars. I think that happens a little bit on here. Definitely. Um, there's so many more stars than you're used to seeing. We have one person who says Orion. Okay. Someone who says the Big Dipper. Yeah, so the Big Dipper is really prominent um, over in the northwestern part of the sky. It kind of looks like a giant spoon that has a bent handle. Orion is actually a winter constellation. So unfortunately, it's not visible right now uh, because it's the summertime. But if you wait a few months, you'll start to see it uh, rising over in the east. Now, the Big Dipper itself is uh, not actually a constellation, but it's just a really familiar group of stars. We call that an asterism. Uh, it's part of a constellation, though. It's uh, the backside of a constellation that comes out here to a point, and then it kind of dips down here a little bit below the horizon. Does anybody know the name of this constellation or what it might be? While we're waiting to hear that answer, um, somebody also said Rigel. And I'm not sure if we can see Rigel right now. Yeah, so Rigel is a star in the constellation of Orion. And again, it's a winter constellation, so it's not visible right now. So if you think about the Earth moving around the sun over the course of the year, um, at different types, at, excuse me, at different times of the year, the nighttime side of the Earth is facing different parts of space. So that's why you can see some constellations in the summertime, but you can't see them in the wintertime. Um, it's all just has to do with where the Earth is facing over the course of a year. So if you were to stay up really, really late, like the, the wee hours of the morning, you might actually be able to see some of Orion rising. Um, but the best time to see him is really in December and January. Um, he'll be really high up in the sky, really bright. And that star, Rigel, the big blue star, is also very visible. I do have an answer for the con constellation that um, Earth's major, or that uh, the Big Dipper is part of, which the answer was there. And I've, I've spoiled it now because I said <laughs> Ursa Major. No worries. Yeah, it's Ursa Major or the Great Bear. And if I click on a star in this constellation, uh, it should come up. There we go. So you can see uh, the whole thing. Doesn't really look like a bear, if you ask me, especially because this is supposed to be the tail of the bear. Um, and then this is the main body. This is the head. And then it's got some legs as well. Uh, not, not very bear-like, in my opinion. It also just really has a long tail. So I can add the artwork there. There's a lot of mythologies and stories that go behind the constellations that have explanations for why this bear has such a long fluffy tail. Um, I just kind of like to think of it as a different species of space bear that has a long tail or something like that. So there are 88 constellations in total of the Greek and Roman constellations. So those are the ones that are officially used to designate different parts of the sky. Um, but there are lots and lots of different constellations out there for all different cultures all around the world. Um, so these are not the only constellations. And so if you were to add up all of them, you'd get a much bigger number than 88. But I just wanted to um, 
preface this with the fact that these are the Greek and Roman ones. So I really like the Big Dipper and starting with the Big Dipper when you're stargazing because it helps you find some other constellations. So if we take these two end stars of the Big Dipper here, we call them the pointer stars, and we connect them and just go make a straight line out until we hit the first uh, brighter star. So it's roughly about five times that distance if you're trying to actually see it in the night sky. Um, and then we'll stop right here at this star, which is actually a very, very famous star. Does anyone know what star that might be? I'm excited to see people's answers to this one. And I also really like the story about this. Um, constellation. So I think you should tell it because it, it makes me really happy. Okay, here we go. Um, the North Star, North Star, North Star. Absolutely. It's the North Star, also known as Polaris. And it is the um, end of the tail of the little bear or Ursa Minor. So I will show you the little bear. It's very cute. And you can see that it also has a very long tail. Um, and one of the stories that I know, I don't know if it's the same one that you're referring to, Janine, but um, the one that I like to tell a lot is that Zeus, the king of the Greek gods, took uh, the big bear by its tail and like swung it around like a lasso and then launched it into space. And that's kind of how its tail got stretched out because that's totally what happens if you pull on a bear's tail. Um, and then because the bear had a baby bear, the baby bear was sad. And so he also took took the baby bear and flew it up into space. But I know there are a million versions of that story. So Janine, do you want to tell the story of the little yeah. bear? So that's adorable. Um, I like the story I've heard is that the mama bear um, kept losing little bear, little bear kept running off all over the place. She's like, no, you got to stay put because I'm worried about losing you. So she stuck his tail to the sky. So he goes around in circles. Oh, that's cute. I like that story a lot better. <laughs> I'm going to use that one from now on, maybe, if I can remember it. Um, so the reason why the bear is stuck in this part of the sky is because the North Star is part of the tail, right? So the reason that the North Star is so famous isn't because it's particularly bright or cool looking. Um, it's a pretty average looking star if you compare it to the other ones in the night sky, but it's famous because it's always in the North. Um, so because of Earth's rotation, stars, the sun, the moon, planets look like they travel across the sky. But in reality, that's only that motion is only because the Earth is spinning. So over time, as the Earth spins, it looks like all of these stars are rotating around this point in the sky. And that's because the North Star just happens to align with the Earth's axis. It's a total coincidence. Uh, there's no South Star. There's no star that happens to align with the South Pole. Uh, we just got really lucky up here in the Northern Hemisphere. So if we were to fast forward time, you would see this star staying put while the, the rest of the constellation, the little bear, would start traveling around like this, which relates to Janine's story about how the bear will always stay right here because he's, his tail got pinned um, and so he can never drift away from the mama bear. All right, uh, so I'm gonna pause there. Have there been any questions so far? We have a question from Cheryl Lee, which is, where is Jupiter? Where is Jupiter? Yeah, so w why don't we go ahead and turn our attention to the southern part of the sky. So right now we're looking north, but now we can spin around and look over in the south. So this is one of my favorite parts of the sky uh, in the summertime because there are some really cool constellations and right now you can see a couple of planets. Now the labels are on, so it kind of gives it away, but the brighter of the two is Jupiter. And the other extremely bright object, but not quite as bright is Saturn. So if we click on Jupiter, um, currently it's in the constellation of Sagittarius, which is the artwork that just came up here. Uh, I like to call this the teapot constellation, because if you just look at the main part here, you can see the top of the teapot, the handle, uh, there's a spout, 
as well. And then there's kind of just some sticks coming off of it that uh, fill in the rest of the constellation. But it does really look like a teapot and Sagittarius points toward the center of the galaxy. So this is a, a cool part of the sky and Jupiter is currently in Sagittarius, but let's zoom in. So this is the view that you would see if you were to look at Jupiter through a telescope. And there are all of these other objects that are in the vicinity of Jupiter. Does anyone know what those are? I like these ones especially. They're very fun. Ah, the moons, moons. Let's see if anybody else has more specific answers. Oh, Callisto, Europa, Io, and Ganymede. Yeah. And much more for moons. Yeah, so these are some of Jupiter's moons. Jupiter has a whole bunch. It has uh, 79 last count. The number does change because we find new moons pretty frequently. Um, but right now it's 79 moons. And the four that you're looking at right here are its biggest moons that were discovered by Galileo because you can actually see them if you look at Jupiter through a telescope. They're big enough and bright enough that you'll actually be able to see them. But the other moons around Jupiter are more difficult to see. Uh, so Europa is an awesome moon because it's covered in ice because Jupiter is so far away from the sun. It's very, very cold in that part of space. Um, so the surface is completely covered in ice, but underneath the surface is actually a liquid water ocean. So it's much warmer inside. Very exciting for astronomers. We want to send lots of spacecraft out to Europa. Io is a really cool moon too. It's got tons and tons of active volcanoes on its surface. And Ganymede is just huge. It's the biggest moon in the solar system. It's bigger than Mercury even. And Callisto is one of the oldest uh, moons in the solar system because its surface is just completely battered and lots of pockmarks and craters and scratches from billions of years of collisions and things like that. But we can zoom in on Jupiter. You can actually see the shadow of Io right here on the surface. There's lots of bands. So those are different gases in the atmosphere of Jupiter that kind of get separated because Jupiter spins really quickly. So uh, there's lots of storms as well. You can actually see a little bit of the great red spot coming into view here. Um, so lots of cool things if you wanted to look at Jupiter with a telescope in the night sky. Otherwise, it's just a really bright object um, over in the south. We've got Saturn pretty close next to it. So I will zoom in on Saturn as well. Also tons of moons. It actually is the king of the solar system in terms of moon counts. It's at 82. There's a whole bunch here, but Saturn's obviously just really, really cool because of its ring system, which you can see through a telescope, and it's just the coolest thing ever. Um, so if you have a chance, you, a backyard telescope, even sometimes a really, really strong pair of binoculars, you can spot Saturn and its rings. Now, those are not the only planets that you can see in the sky right now. You can also see over in the east, uh, low in the east, you can also see Mars. And you'll know that it's Mars because it's bright, and also it's got a reddish hue to it because of all of the iron uh, or the rust in Mars's soil. And there's been some exciting news about Mars recently because of the Perseverance rover that was just sent to Mars. It's going to land in February of 2021. And its job will be to search for signs of ancient life on the surface of Mars. So lots of cool stuff uh, soon to be happening with Mars. That was a really long answer to one question. <laughs> Are there any other questions, Janine? Yeah, there's um, a couple. So Bronwyn, who is nine, would like to know what the connection between Greek mythology and I, they said ast astrology, but I think they mean astronomy. Yeah, so actually, I mean, both of those things used to be connected. So in ancient Greece um, and some other like surrounding areas, ancient Egypt, um, you know, thousands of years ago, when they were looking up at the sky, astronomy and astrology were actually closely related because they were just trying to figure out where things are in the sky and if they had any effect on 
people on the earth. And it was a time where there wasn't a whole lot known about space yet. Um, so a lot of the constellations, the, the different groups of stars in the sky, they all just come from Greek mythology, uh, at least the ones, again, the ones that we're talking about. There are all different other types of mythologies out there um, that constellations are based off of. But I imagine that that connection was made just because when you look up at the sky, it can just be a really awesome emotional, overwhelming experience sometime if you're looking at all these different stars. So I imagine that they would want to connect it to, um, you know, their mythologies and, and things like that. So I think that's probably where the connection was made. But also you have the area of astrology, which is not related to astronomy. But uh, back then it was more closely related because we knew less. Now we know that the constellations are made up of stars, which are incredibly far away. We know how stars work. It's much more science oriented um, rather than astrology, which has kind of branched away from that now. So um, there is still a little bit of mixing when we look at, at the names of things and, and certain constellations and things like that. Yeah, one of my favorite things is that the name planet um, comes from the Greek word for wanderer because they would go across the stars and um, as they would follow them, sometimes they would look like they were going backwards. Uh, we have lots of questions about planets that are visible. So um, Faith, age nine, wants to know, can we see pl Pluto right now? Okay, so Pluto, unfortunately, um, Pluto is really, really small and really far away. So even if Pluto was in the sky, uh, in a certain area of the sky that is visible right now, um, you still wouldn't be able to see it with your eyes because it is super tiny and really far away. Pluto's only the size of about half of the United States. So really tiny, could easily fit inside the moon. And it's also billions of miles away, like 5 billion miles away from the sun. So uh, we would never be able to see Pluto with the naked eye. You also, even looking at it through a telescope is really, really difficult as well. And we had one picture of Pluto before we sent a spacecraft there taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, which is one of our most powerful uh, telescopes that's in orbit around the Earth. So it's above Earth's atmosphere. And it took a picture of Pluto and even that picture was really bad. So we didn't have a really good up close look at Pluto until we sent a spacecraft to fly by. Um, and that happened a few years ago in 2015. And so now we have an up close look at Pluto, but you're not gonna have any luck with with your eyes or even a telescope um, if you're trying to find it. And then someone wants to know if we can see Venus. Yeah, Venus is not visible right now. So Venus is either going to be visible at dusk or at dawn because it's closer to the sun than the earth is. So it's always close to the sun in the sky. So that's why those two times are the only times that you would actually see Venus. And right now it's not, I don't believe it's visible at dusk. It might be visible at dawn, but I'm actually not totally sure about that one. Um, right before we end the program, we can speed up time to the early morning and see if we can spot Venus. And then we'll be able to tell if it's uh, visible or not in the early morning. We also have questions about the rest of the planets of Neptune, Uranus, and Mercury are all being asked about. Okay. So Uranus is, so with the naked eye, you can only see planets out to Saturn. Saturn's the farthest planet that you can see with your eyes at night. Once you start getting past that, like Uranus and Neptune, the outer gas giants, they're too far away. Um, we tend to think of the scale of the solar system as the planets being equally spaced out, but it's a lot bigger than that. So basically Jupiter is twice the distance from the sun as Mars is. So just to name all the planets in order, we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So if Jupiter is double the distance that Mars is, Saturn is then double the distance that Jupiter is. And so Uranus is double Saturn's distance. You get 
you get the deal. So it's incredibly far away, even though it's, you know, the one right after Saturn, it's double as far away as Saturn is. So Uranus and Neptune, you can't spot them with the naked eye. But if you have a telescope, you might be able to see them. All right, so uh, awesome questions. And oh, also here is Neptune in the sky and Uranus over here. So if you do have a telescope and wanted to take a look, um, you can look in the constellation uh, over, let's see here, this is Aquarius. And this, is, this constellation is pretty faint. Um, so you might actually want to use a program like Stellarium or Worldwide Telescope to find the exact locations of the planets. Uh, to kind of guide you a little bit because the constellations in this area are pretty dim. Uh, but I did want to point out at least a couple more constellations before we end today. So I'm just going to put them all up. Uh, let's see, here we go. So there are a whole bunch visible and I said there were 88 constellations in total, but you're never going to see all 88 of them at the same time. Um, you'll only see about a quarter of them because again, it depends on what time of the year it is and it also depends on what hemisphere you're in. So if you're in the southern hemisphere, you're going to see lots and lots of different constellations than you would up here in the north. Um, but some more prominent constellations that are directly overhead pretty much are three constellations that make up the summer triangle. And these three stars are pretty easy to find because they're some of the brightest stars in the night sky. So this first one over here is called uh, Vega, and it's part of Lyra the Lyre, which you can see is a U-shaped harp. Over here, we have another really bright star called Deneb, and that's part of Cygnus the Swan. And then we have Altair, which is part of Aquila the Eagle. And let me take down the artwork just so you can see what the stars look like. So you can see uh, these three here are much brighter than the stars around them. So I like to point these out because it's pretty easy to find. It's very high overhead uh, and the plane of our galaxy runs right through the middle. So those are great ones to look for as well. So I will stop there and see if there's any other questions before we end the program today. Um, we have a question from Kai, if we can see any galaxies um, or solar systems. <laughs> yeah, okay, so real quick, uh, the difference between a solar system and a galaxy. So a solar system, our solar system in particular, is made up of one star, which is the sun, and then it has eight planets, as well as asteroids and another belt of objects, which Pluto belongs to, and that's pretty much it, and some other icy objects, um, and moons, of course, but there's only one star. So every star that you're looking at right now could have its own solar system, and as a matter of fact, a lot of them do. We have found planets orbiting around other stars, but the galaxy is like all of those stars all clustered together. So uh, our solar system is just one star. And then the entire Milky Way galaxy that we are a part of is made up of about 300 billion stars. That's just our galaxy. There are lots of other galaxies. We estimate 2 trillion galaxies just in what we can see. Um, and there are some other galaxies or one and one in particular that you can see with the naked eye. So I'm gonna put constellation lines back up because this will help you see it. So uh, if you look over in the east, so if you're looking at Mars, you can also spot this. And you go a little higher up in the sky, you'll find four stars in the shape of a square. This is the great square of Pegasus. And Pegasus is a flying horse. So the, here's the head, it's kind of upside down. And then here are the two front legs. There's no back, <laughs> it's just, just cut right in half. Um, but if you look at this kind of corner star, you'll see a branching line of stars coming out there. This is a different constellation called Andromeda. And so the Andromeda galaxy is in this part of the sky as well. So there is Andromeda for mythology. There's uh, the Andromeda constellation. And then there is the Andromeda galaxy. So it's named uh, or 
a lot of things are named after Andromeda, uh, but the constellation will point you in the direction of the galaxy. So if you see this really faint smudge, we zoom in, you can definitely see it much easier. Um, but this faint smudge here is our nearest major neighbor. Uh, it's two and a half million light years away. That means that all the light from Andromeda uh, that we see now has traveled two and a half million years to reach us. And we are on a collision course with Andromeda. So in about four billion years, the Milky Way and Andromeda will collide to form one giant galaxy. And people want to call it Milkdromeda but I am glad that we have four and a half billion years to come up with something better. Yeah, I agree. That one, uh, that could use some finessing on that name there. Definitely. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Katie, for showing us what's up in the sky tonight. Um, of course. We had so many great questions from all of you. Uh, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but uh, we do this a lot. So we can tune in pretty much every Friday and we'll have something fun to, to talk about. Um, I'll let you say goodbye, Katie. Bye everyone. And I'll pull up our end screen so that those of you who were interested in um, that Stellarium website, that software that Katie was using to take you on this night sky tour, now you can see what that is. Um, I wanna thank you all so much for joining us today. If you wanna see what other virtual programs we're doing, either about space or maybe lightning, maybe you're interested in that, that's happening at three today. Um, you can follow the museum on our social media channels or you can check out www.mos.org slash MOS at home. And if you enjoyed today's presentation and would like to support more programming like this, please visit engage.mos.org slash welcome to support MOS at home. And as I mentioned before, today's program was produced using the free software Stellarium, um, which you can find at stellarium.org. Thanks everybody for participating and we hope you'll join us again soon.